What a morning to come and worship the God of heaven. The Saviour is risen and death has not conquered, but Christ has overcome. And we're here this Easter morning again to remember what God in Christ has done and that for his people, life can be found. Well, this morning we have a visiting preacher. is uh, Mark Thomas from Boris Park, Wrexham. And in a moment, he's going to be opening up God's word. Well, our focus this morning is going to be the book of Luke and that wonderful chapter when we uh, see the Christ uh, risen from the grave. So it's Luke's gospel and chapter 24. And we're going to start reading the first 11 verses. So here's God's word. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you, while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all those things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told them the things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose, ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marvelling at what had happened. Well, that's the great hope, isn't it? As God's people, the Christ who has conquered death, his promises is going to gather his people, that uh, we're going to be men and women, where death will not hold us, but in Christ we're going to stand with him. Well, let's pray, and then we're going to sing and uh, hear what Mark has to tell us today. Let's pray. Father, as we come in these moments, we, we are people who see death all around us. We're men and women who have fear of tomorrow, and yet your word declares in Christ uh, we need not fear. Uh, death can't hold us, and there's going to be a future, new mind, new body, where we'll stand with that Jesus Christ, with the eternal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in a world made new to enjoy him forever. And we just pray, Lord, as we look at this world, as we look at the brokenness of this world, that we'd be men and women who run to that Christ, find hope in him, and declare that hope to this world. Uh, we want to be like Peter, who, who runs and finds for ourselves this Jesus who's risen and marvel. Oh Lord, this morning, uh, thrill our hearts, may we be those who marvel and declare to the world all that God in Christ has done. He has conquered death, and in him life is found. We commit ourselves to you, uh, encourage us, and Lord, may we be seekers of what's right and good for your glory. Amen.
Now turn with me, please. Uh, Luke chapter 24, verses 1 to 12. That's the passage we read, and on this Easter Sunday morning, it's some of the truths in that passage I want us to think about. Now, one of the unexpected things that's happened during this whole COVID pandemic is the way that rainbows seem to have popped up all over the place. I'm sure you've noticed that. Now, the rainbow has become a symbol of hope again. It's been other things in our previous years. The rainbow became a symbol for post-apartheid South Africa, if you remember, the rainbow nation. And the rainbow flag some time ago became a symbol of gay pride. But during the COVID pandemic, it's been seen again as a symbol of hope. And children in particular have been encouraged to colour in rainbows and stick them in the window or colour rainbows in chalk on the pavements outside their house. And the idea was this. Storms don't last forever. Life will go back to normal. Eventually. Just without the ones that we have lost. That was the idea. Storms don't last forever. Life will go on. Now, we all have great reason to be thankful, particularly thankful to God that the vaccinations are proving effective, that COVID is on the wane. We trust that it'll carry on on a downward trajectory now that people are mixing more. And it does seem that on that level as if the storm is passing and life is returning to normal. But let me ask you this morning, is that all we can hope for? that life gets back to the way it was before. Is that all we can hope for? Or is it possible to hope for something more and something greater? Now, you see, in the Bible, God draws attention to the rainbow as a symbol of hope. In Genesis chapter 9, after the flood in the days of Noah, the flood had been a judgment of God on mankind for its wickedness. And we read in Genesis chapter 6, excuse me, the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them from the earth. And the flood came, and that was a destruction far greater than the destruction that we've seen with COVID. But God in his mercy, saved Noah and his family. And after the flood in Genesis chapter 9, God said, it shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud. And I'll remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. So God adopted the rainbow as the symbol of hope. He made a promise that never again would he bring a flood to destroy the world in response to the wickedness and violence of mankind. Instead, he would show patience and forbearance with mankind despite their wickedness. But hold on, what sort of hope is that? Is God saying, well, okay, the world was a corrupt, violent place, but I suppose that's just the way it has to be. So I won't judge them. I'll just have to put up with it and use the rainbow to show I don't really mind and I don't really care. Just get on with it. You see, it isn't that. God has so much more to do in the world than just let things go back to the way they were before. Rather, what God promises at the time of the flood, what the rainbow is a sign of, is that God is showing patience to the world, despite the disobedience of people, despite the corruption and the violence that we see all around us. He's showing patience until somebody steps into the situation who can deal with the world's wickedness and violence, who can give us a better tomorrow, who can change the situation and who can change lives so that we can know something in our lives which is better. The rainbow doesn't say, hold on, things will get back to normal. The rainbow says, hold on, Christ is coming. The Christ that I promised to Adam and Eve, the seed of the woman who would bruise the serpent's head, Christ is coming. And when he comes, 
he will bring a salvation that will change it all. A salvation that starts from the inside of men and women. A salvation that deals with corruption, and that deals with wickedness, and that deals with violence. A salvation that makes things so much better. A salvation which ultimately deals with death. Now that's the storyline of the Bible. That's it in a nutshell. God in patience doesn't step into the world and end it because of our rebellion. But God in patience bears with us so that the Lord Jesus Christ might come. And so that in days like these, the Lord Jesus Christ might work in the lives of men and women to deliver them and to save them and to set them free. All the hopes and fears of mankind ultimately center in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done. And the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy 1, he says that Christ has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. He's abolished death and he's brought to light life and immortality. And that in the gospel, those great truths and realities are proclaimed to us. Because that's what God does. He doesn't say, I suppose it doesn't matter. He doesn't say, I can't do anything about it, get on with it. What he says is, the Lord Jesus Christ can overcome death. He has overcome death. And the Lord Jesus Christ can bring real life. A life that starts now. And a life that continues forever. So here's the challenge today. Is the best that we can hope for that life goes on the same as it always has? The same struggles and the same joys, the same fears, and the same ultimate failure of life in death? Or is there more? Is there the possibility of more? Is there more for me? And is there more for you? See, the greatest mistake that we can make, really, but a mistake that people make every day, is to think that this life and this death is all there is. The truth is, the truth that we see at Easter, is that the world, in all its corruption and its violence, in all its sadness and its hopelessness, needs something. It needs the Lord Jesus Christ to step in and to bring new life, new eternal life that changes our today, that changes our tomorrow, that changes everything. So what about us? Has the Lord Jesus Christ stepped in and has he abolished our death? And has he brought life and immortality into clear focus for us? Now what I want us to do from Luke 24 is just to see the way that these things are revealed in real terms in the lives of the people we read about, okay? We start off with this, the hopelessness that surrounded the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because after all, there's something very final about death. And let's make no mistake, Jesus Christ died. And death is the end, isn't it? It's the end of careers and ambitions. It's the end of plans and dreams. It's the end of relationships and pleasures. And for the people left behind when someone dies, there's a storm of grief and adjustment. And nothing can bring back our plans and our dreams and our relationships. But we have to find a way to carry on. Well, is that what happened at the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ when he died? In some ways it is. You can jump back into chapter 23 and see a bit of this. In verse 47, you have the centurion. Excuse me. Um, let's find him, the centurion. Verse 47. When the centurion saw what had happened, the way that Jesus had died, he glorified God, saying, certainly this was a righteous man. He was convinced that Jesus was an innocent man who didn't deserve to die like this. Too late, he's dead now. Then you jump on to verse 48, and you have the crowds, the crowds who had been calling out, crucify crucify him. 
they came together to the site, they saw what happened, and they beat their breasts. They came to realize that they'd made a terrible mistake. And in anguish, they wished they could turn the clock back. But it was too late. He was dead now. Then you have Joseph of Arimathea in the following verses, verse 51 and such like, 50, 51. He was a good man, a member of the Sanhedrin. He hadn't consented to the death of Christ. He had a tomb of his own, and he asked Pilate for the body so that he could lay Jesus' body in his own unused tomb. He had done what he could, but Jesus was dead now. And then in verse 55, you've got the women who'd come with him from Galilee and followed him. They'd stood at the foot of the cross as he had died. You see that if you read the gospel accounts. And now they are preparing the spices to anoint the body. And that's all they can do. Because he's dead now. See, it's, it's very striking the way these things are presented to us in the gospel here. Because for the women in particular, their lives had been changed by meeting with Jesus. But he's dead now. So what does the future hold? It seems to them that after the storm has passed... The best they could hope for was to find some way to carry on. They got their memories. They remember his teaching. They've seen his example. They've got those things, but they haven't got him. Because death has defeated him and taken him away. And however affected they may have been by his words, however helped they may have been by his miracles and his kindness, now they're going to have to carry on without him as best they could. Despite the difference that he's made, they don't have him. Where can you see that? Is that really, in the face of death, all there is to hope for? The memories, the teaching, the example but we're left to our own devices and we've just got to get on with life the best we can. If we view life like that, we are bound to be hopeless. Bound to be hopeless. Because if we are left to our own devices and our own resources, how can we ever change the world? The reality is, isn't it, that the world is governed and populated by people whose hearts and lives know corruption and violence. That's the reality of a fallen world. How can the world change if we've got nothing more than our memories and our good wishes? But we still have our sinful hearts. It's true on a personal level. If we're left to our own resources, how can we change? We might have lots of good intentions, but we're still faced with our own selfishness. And we're still faced with our own bias. And the reality of death still looms over us and casts its shadow over everything. What kind of hope is there if we're left to ourselves and if Jesus Christ is dead? Well, you know, worse still, some people's religion is like that. Look at verse 5. They were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth. And the angel said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead. Some people think that the only religious hope they have is in seeking the dead things, the things of this earth, because Christ himself can't step in and can't help us, so we're left with a religious ritual, you know? Well, at least we can go to church and we can pray and we can hope, but we don't really expect that anything's going to happen. We'd like to be forgiven when we die, but we don't think we can be forgiven today. We'd like eventually to become a bit better, but we don't think our hearts can be changed. Religious ritual is just a dead thing. It can't really do anything for us. It's hopeless. Self-help is the same, you know. Self-help is really popular at the moment, particularly because there's this rising tide of anxiety. 
and fear. And I'm not knocking self-help. Self-help can be really useful to deliver us from irrational fears. But you know what self-help can't do? It can't fundamentally help you. Because it can't change your heart. It can't change the way the holy God sees you. And it can't keep you safe when you die. Why are we seeking life from dead things? Why are we seeking the living among the dead? Medicine is the same, isn't it? Now, medicine is great. But all medicine can do is extend our lives or make our lives more comfortable. But it can't bring us back from the dead, even cryogenics. You know, chop your head off, have it frozen, and then hopefully a couple of hundred years in the future, they'll find a way of bringing you back to life. Even if they could, you're still going to die again. Ultimately, medicine can't fix the real problem because it can't change the heart and it can't put off death inevitably. The reality is we'll never find life from the dead things. Even morality is like that. People think what I have to do is try my best and hope that God knows that at least I'm trying. But we forget, as the Apostle Paul tells us, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. By the law is the knowledge of sin. What's he saying? The law can show you how you fail, but the law, you can't keep it. It's like somebody passing a tray of food around with filthy, dirty hands and offering it to the king. When we've broken God's law already, and we are dirty people, how can we hope that keeping God's law will somehow save us? These things are just dead, and they can never give us life. The reality is we need more. And that's what God promised in the book of Genesis. That's what the rainbow symbolizes at the time of the flood. And that's what happened when Jesus Christ came into the world. He came into the world to give us more. So the angel goes on in verse 6. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. And that's the truth that changes everything. Because real hope, hope for a change, hope for deliverance, hope for forgiveness, hope for a new life, hope for a safe eternity. It comes from the Christ who has conquered death and who is alive forevermore. Don't seek the living among the dead. He's not here. He's risen. And if he's risen, he can do for us far, far more than we could ever do for ourselves. If he's risen, he can really save. So let's think about this. He's risen, so he's conquered death, physical death. Now, the resurrection accounts in the New Testament show us clearly that the Lord Jesus Christ left the tomb with the same body with which he died. And that means that the heart that had stopped beating started beating again, and the brain that had switched off regained its function. And that body and soul were reunited. And that on Easter Sunday morning, he was dead, but behold, he is alive forevermore. Now think about this. There is no other hope anywhere in the history of the world for physical resurrection, for people coming back to life, other than through the Lord Jesus Christ, the resurrection and the life the one who's described in the New Testament as the Prince of Life. He's the one who can give real life and who can overcome death. So physical death, but also eternal death. Because you see, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ wasn't just quietly stopping breathing and returning to the Father. The death of the Lord Jesus Christ involved suffering. I remember talking about this with some Jehovah's Witnesses once I was in a conversation with. Because Jehovah's Witnesses, you may know, don't believe in hell. 
they don't believe that there's any real punishment for sin other than physical death. So in conversation, I said to them, if all that sin deserves before God is physical death, why didn't Jesus just die? Why did he suffer? And it's a very important point in the Bible because the Bible not only talks about physical death, but it talks about the second death, eternal death. The reality of hell, where a man or woman is justly separated from God because of their sins. The wages of sin is death, physical death and eternal death. And in the three hours of darkness, in particular on the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ experienced that second death. When the wrath of God came to meet him and the wrath of God came to kill him. And the reason is, he bore our sins in his own body on the tree. But you know what? After three hours of darkness, the darkness lifted. And the Lord Jesus Christ cried, it is finished. Because he conquered over eternal death. He drank the cup of God's wrath and he drank it to the very dregs. And because of that, there's nothing left for us if we trust in him. You see, this is real hope. Real hope means that because of Christ, death and hell are not inevitable. We don't have to be separated from God and we don't have to face what our sins deserve. The Lord Jesus Christ has faced it and he's conquered over it and he can set us free. So there's that. Second thing, Christ has transcended earthly life. When he rose from the dead, he was no longer subject to weakness and frailty. He was no longer subject to temptation. He was glorified. He was taken out of this realm, dominated by sin and suffering, and he ascended to heaven and was given all authority in heaven and on earth. And we make a terrible mistake when we think that Christ is as limited as we are, and that he can't help us, as if the only power he's got is the power to encourage us to try harder. It's not true. The power that the Lord Jesus Christ has is the power to step in and save. He's not among the dead, as powerless as we are. He's risen, and he has all power, the power to step in and save. So two things. Because of Christ, death and hell are not inevitable. And because of Christ, our lives don't have to be dominated by wickedness and violence. The Lord Jesus Christ can give life on the inside. He can change the heart. And he can bring us back to God. There's hope. So we need to think about new life in Christ. God's promise sealed with the rainbow that he wouldn't flood the world again despite its wickedness and violence finds its reason here on Easter Sunday. That in Christ, God has found a way for wicked, violent people to be saved and changed, for death to be abolished, and for life and immortality to be brought to light in you and in me. Because in Christ, it all changes. Physical death is stripped of its fear. In the New Testament, Christians are described as those who sleep in Jesus when they die. And the point is, although the prospect of dying itself isn't pleasant, the reality of death for the Christian is that they pass into the presence of Christ, the living Christ, the one who's loved them and given himself for them. They pass into peace and safety. Think of the first Christian martyr recorded in the New Testament, Stephen, in the book of Acts. They stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He's not dead, he's alive. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he knelt down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, 
he fell asleep. Physical death, it's stripped of its fear. Eternal death, it's replaced by eternal life. When Jesus drank the cup of God's wrath to the dregs, what it means is there's no wrath left in the cup of God for his people. For anybody who believes in him, there is no condemnation because they're in Christ Jesus. As we read in Isaiah 53, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. We esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. Did it work? And by his stripes, we are healed. You see it? Physical death need produce no fear because what lies beyond physical death isn't being cast out of the presence of God into everlasting punishment but being welcomed into the Father's house to be with the Savior who's loved us and given himself for us, to rejoice in him and to see him and to be like him. Eternal death is swallowed up in eternal life. And today, in place of spiritual death, the death of the heart in our estrangement from God, our wickedness and our violence, the Lord Jesus Christ can give spiritual life. People say, why doesn't God stop the evil in the world? Well, like at the flood. Stop the evil in the world means getting rid of the evil people, doesn't it? But God said, no, I won't do that again. I won't do that again. I'll find another way. Rather than end them, I'll change them. That's the point of the gospel. So the Lord Jesus Christ comes that he can take the wickedness and violence out of our hearts and make us into new people. Because that's the problem in the world. The, vi the wickedness and the violence of the world comes from the hearts of the people in the world. We see it everywhere. But now, Christ is alive. And because Christ is alive and has conquered sin, he can reach into our hearts and he can change us. He can give us a new heart. Now think about that. He can change what we love. The problem with sin is that we love it, even though we know it's wrong. And we try and convince ourselves that it isn't. How are we going to change that? We need a new heart. But the Lord Jesus Christ, by his Spirit, steps in and he changes our hearts so that he changes what we love. And instead of loving sin, we come to love him. To love our God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength, or at least begin to do so. To love our neighbours as ourselves. That's how the world changes. One individual at a time from the inside out. Christ can do it. There's no point looking amongst the dead. Nobody can help us. But Christ is risen. And he can step in. And he can save. He gives us a new heart and he gives us a new will. And what I mean by that is, he changes our allegiance. Why do we insist on doing what we do? It's because of the things we love. Well, when he changes the things we love, he changes the things we do. We live for him who died for us. And because we love him, we keep his commandments. And that's how the world changes. You see, Christ delivers from hell. Praise God for that. Christ delivers from guilt. Praise God for that. But Christ delivers us from ourselves. And that's a wonderful thing. That his salvation reaches from heaven to hell and comes back up into the heart. And in the heart, it says... I have loved you and given myself for you. Turn from these things and trust me. Follow me and live a new life. And I'll help you. And I'll carry you through. That's the way the gospel works. Now there's been a caricature around for a while that Christianity is petty and old-fashioned and that Christians are self-righteous. 
But the reality is that societies have been changed for the better. It's just a fact of history. You read Tom Holland's new book, Dominion. Society has been changed for the better as people have become Christians and they've been changed for the better. And so many of the strengths of Western society are rooted in the teaching of Christianity. No, no. They're rooted not just in the teaching of Christianity, but in the power of Christ in the lives of the people that he saves. Hospitals, schools, orphanages, the removal of corruption at the political level, family breakdown. These things are changed and transformed when Christ changes the heart. And we've seen a bit of this through the COVID pandemic. Boris Johnson's made an Easter statement. And apparently he said that Christians have showed what loving your neighbour as yourself really looks like in the 21st century. That's interesting during the COVID pandemic. And Keir Starmer has said that he is in awe of the Christian community for its work in the past year. Now, I don't know how great and how significant that work has been, but thank God for it. But what I do know is where it's genuine, it's the fruit of the love of Christ in the heart. So do we love him? Has he changed us? Does it matter? Do we want to live our lives with corruption and violence? Or do we want to be people who live for God and who live for others? Who live good lives and who are transformed and who look forward to the day when we'll see the Saviour as he is? You never find that power among the dead. That power has to come from the risen one who's conquered over it all and who can step in and who can set us free. So here's my last point. Seek Christ for life. When Christ rose from the dead, he didn't keep himself aloof from people. He appeared to them he met with them, he talked with them, he assured them, he comforted them, he gave them real hope. And the same is true today, because Christ is alive. So he can hear us. He hears the cries and the prayers of every broken heart. He knows the burdens that we carry. He knows that life is too difficult for us. He knows that we've made mistakes. He knows that we can't face death. He knows that we're afraid. But you know what? He also knows that he's bigger than that. And if only we'll trust him, he'll help us. He knows that, so seek him. Because not only can he hear, but he can save. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, he says. How does he use that authority? That's 531. God has exalted him to his right hand to be prince and saviour. Why? To give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Things don't have to carry on in the same old way because Christ can change it. There is repentance, a change of life and a change of heart. I can't do it. Christ can do it. He can give it if you turn to him. He can step down and change you. Not only repentance, but the forgiveness of sins. Christ forgives today. He gives a clean conscience. He gives peace with God. He gives the assurance of heaven because he's taken away our sins. All of these things come from a living Christ. So today, I want to do two things. I want you to leave here without any doubt in your mind that Christ is alive and that Christ can save. But on the back of that, I want you to leave here being people who commit yourselves to seek Christ, that Christ might give you life. Because if you have the Son, you have life. Because he's Christ, risen from the dead. Today, on this Easter Sunday, don't think, Christ is in heaven, he's too far away, he can't help me. He's near to everyone who calls on him. Christ steps in and he saves. Don't think, my life is too bad. Christ knew the states of our lives when he came into the world to die for sinners. Don't think he could never change me. You know what, in a remarkable way he can. 
because he has all authority and all power. He is Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. Never doubt him, but trust him to be the living Savior. Trust him to be your living Savior today. Might that be the experience of all of us at this Easter? Thank you.